Hi, how are you guys? Uh, my name is Zach Turner. I am a Guilford High School graduate, class of 2014. I'm also a graduate of Middlesex Community College in Middletown, Connecticut, where I focused on broadcast cinema, which is a mix of television and film. Today we're going to be talking about the history of storytelling from the very beginning up until modern day. Of course, you see here on the board, section one is the history of storytelling, and then section two is modern storytelling and media. We'll also be talking briefly about careers in media and what options there are for people from different walks of life and different ages. And then the third section, of course, will be Q&A. And big shout out to GCTV for covering the event and for setting this all up. I really appreciate that, Shannon, and for all the, uh, the board members over there at GCTV, thank you again um, for organizing this. And so let's just hop right into it. Um, in my belief, the story of, well, storytelling begins at the beginning of humanity, where Neanderthals weren't able to communicate via written word or via spoken word, just grunts, and they had images in their mind, memories, that they wanted to convey desperately to other people. And so what they did was the only thing they knew how to do, use their hands. And so they draw drawings on the cave walls in the very places they live. Now, after spoken word kind of came away from uh, from there, um, we got more than just, hey, can you hand me that rock? We got legends of gods, of heroes, of villains, of creatures that may or may not exist, all mythology that began at the beginning of humanity. Fast forward a bit. These legends grow over time and change with the generations as they come and pass wane and wax, and things change into something a little different. Theater becomes popular because these people not only want to tell these mythologies, they want to act them, they want to convey their emotion through it, and in 501 BC, theater becomes popular in Athens and Greece. Now, the first genre of theater that became popular was satire. And in the 50 years that follow, theater became much more popular over those two regions and then throughout hundreds of years later, whether it be in, of course, America centuries later, millennia later really, or Asia, more recent to that. And two more very important genres come out of this, drama and comedy. Now, these two genres along with satire, these three, have influenced modern culture even today, and will continue to influence modern culture into the future. I mean, how many seasons of SNL are we up to now, right? Over 50, probably? And so, I think it's important that we stress just how old and influential theater is. It's been one of the oldest, well, it is one of the oldest art forms in history, existing for more than 2,500 years. And people who study theater, people who study the craft, different styles, different plays that exist, they are committed to it for life because there is no way that one person can learn all there is to offer from theater in one lifetime. There's 2,500 years of knowledge. And mind you, it's not just one play happening every so often. There are multiple plays happening at all different times kinds of times throughout history. And, I mean, there's thousands. There's different styles, there's different takes on it, there's different subjects. And uh, I think it's, it's just very interesting how that all works. And it ties into filmmaking in a very unique way. Because filmmaking draws from theater in a large number of ways. Not just the acting, but the set building, the props, the storyline, the three-act structure. Before we get into that, though, I do want to talk about the origin of filmmaking and how it kind of came to be. First, we're going to talk about Leland Stanford and Edward Moybridge. These two gentlemen, they were not really filmmakers to begin with. Leland actually owned a horse farm where he bred and raised uh, racehorses, and he hired Edward Moybridge to take a syst uh, systematic kind of approach 
to photo photographing these horses. And so Moybridge went through a few different trials and errors and eventually figured out how to take 12 consecutive photos of one horse running. And after these two failed attempts, he succeeded. Now, in the classes that I took at MXCC, there was a little bit of a rumor that was started about these two guys. They had a bit of a bet. One of them wanted to see if a horse, while running, would jump off of all four hooves. Now, this turned out to be true. The press reported on it. However, apparently, the photos were doctored a little bit. But nonetheless, the original photo stood strong, and it turned out to be true. Now, I personally can't remember which one of these two gentlemen won the bet. But Edward Moybridge saw potential in this new form of media in showing animals moving in an image, a moving image. And he did this hundreds of times with countless different subjects. And it proved very profitable for him. But this is just the beginning of filmmaking. Right after that, there was a new device. And essentially this device, you put a quarter in and you're able to watch a one minute silent film. Typically they were under a minute though. They weren't very long. But it was sort of a fun little attraction that would be at the sort of lounge of events and of <coughs> restaurants. And essentially this got people interested in filmmaking. It got people interested in seeing, wow, this image is moving, things are changing. And that kind of brought that to the public eye. If I remember correctly, the device was called a kinetoscope. And uh, yeah, essentially you put a quarter in, you lean over, you see the one minute short film, and that's it. Now, after this, a lot of short films began to be made, uh, most comedy, some drama, a lot of just sort of slapstick, like kicking the tuchus, and that's the entire joke. <laughs> and I think those were definitely useful. They definitely offered certain things to filmmaking. But it's important we focus on a couple important gems that really mark the times for filmmaking. And the first of these gems is A Trip to the Moon. And A Trip to the Moon was the first sci-fi film ever made. Ever. And this was before people had even been to the moon. The story follows a few astronomers, and they launch themselves in a cannon to the moon. And on the moon they find aliens, which are just guys dressed up in a full bodysuit, just black bodysuit, doing weird acrobatics. And that was meant to show that they were, in fact, aliens. Um, Kind of a, a weird way of doing it, I grant you. But the set design, the set design, the props, the costumes in this film were unparalleled for their time. They were innovative, unique, unheard of. Maybe a bit off the beaten path. Uh, another unique thing that I really liked about that was that instead of showing, you know, a, a spear going into one of the aliens' chests, what they did was, when they got whacked with a stick, instead of dying on the spot, they cut away. They, they stopped the action right there. They put a smoke bomb in front of the, uh, the actor with the stick. And when they got hit with the stick, the smoke bomb would explode, and they would cut directly to that. So essentially, it would look like the alien was vanishing into a cloud of smoke when it died. And, I mean, no one had done that yet. No one had done anything even remotely like that, to where they stop the action, replace it, do something new, and cut back to it, as if nothing had happened, to create consistent action. Now, this is a concept called cutting. And cutting, it's a very unique thing. I would say that the origin of it starts in the Soviet Union, because Russia at the time, in the 1910s, was a very illiterate nation. The people there didn't know how to read or write, and so the newly formed Soviet government had to find a way to communicate with them.
the co-founder of that school, the Moscow School of Film, was Lev Kuleshov. And Lev Kuleshov conducted an experiment that was kind of outside of the beaten path when it comes to the Moscow School of Film. And essentially there were three different focus groups and they were each shown a short video with three different clips. And essentially what it was was a guy without any expression on his face, completely neutral, followed by another clip of, in this case, the first case, for the first focus group, a hot bowl of soup. And then they would cut back to the guy with the face and ask the audience what he was feeling. In the first case, they thought hunger. In the second case, the guy appeared expressionless yet again, and then was shown, the audience was shown a clip of a woman lounging on a chair. Then back to the man. When asked what the audience felt or thought he was feeling, they thought he was feeling attracted to her, lust. And the third one essentially was that there was a guy, same guy, expressionless, looking at, in the second clip, a coffin of a corpse. And then back to the guy with the expressionless face. When asked what they, the audience felt he was feeling in that case, they thought sorrow, mourning. Now, this just goes to show that one guy without any expression on his face, followed by another image, then returned to him. That generates emotion that generates meaning. The guy's face alone, utterly meaningless, but in sequence, has meaning. Now this is the first instance of cutting. This is when the Soviets realized if they found a way to cut together imagery in a way that elicited emotion in, this, in the Russian people, they could essentially control them. It would be propaganda. That was the birth of propaganda, in film at least. However, montage theory, as it came to be known, actually was used quite heavily in other markets, namely America. And it's actually something that we see quite a bit of today. It's something that is all over the place in filmmaking. Pretty much every cinematic work has some bit of montage. Another thing that really is the driving force of filmmaking now is classical cutting. Now classical cutting arose from montage theory, but also was influenced by a number of other things. Cutting to continuity, making sure that objects are in their place at all times and that nothing is out of place. An example of where cutting to continuity failed, and this is the job of the script supervisor in this case, was the Game of Thrones episodes in the final season. I'm sure if you don't even watch Game of Thrones, you've probably heard of it, where they have the Starbucks cup sitting on the table in a fantasy world. Now, the network, HBO, heard about this, and it was immediately corrected about two days later, immediately. But truthfully, it should have been caught early on. It should have been something that the script supervisor had taken care of. But being someone who has done script supervising on a, num a couple of jobs, I can sympathize. When you're working on a job that big, with that many moving parts, you're going to miss something. You're going to miss something, and the script supervisor did. Twice, actually. There was a second episode where a <laughs> another Starbucks cup, this time clear, was seen on the table. Same scene, different cup. And, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's classical cutting. Now, the second example of a shift in filmmaking is Citizen Kane, considered by many to be the greatest film of all time, specifically my professor, who had us write a seven to ten page essay with five sources on it about why it's the best film ever. Now, this may be a forced perspective, but it goes to show that even if you don't think it is, you can still find ways to appreciate that it is a great film. I came to realize that. Citizen Kane does not abide by the three-act structure found in most films. 
It's a bit more abstract. It begins with a news segment detailing the life, achievements, and then death of our main character, Charles Foster Kane. Modeled after a rich person that uh, the writer of the film did not like very much. And it actually, the film actually includes some of his secrets. And uh, when his wife saw it, his surviving wife, she was not pleased. She was not pleased one bit. But he did some scummy things. In any case, Susan Kane begins with that, which is, is nuts. It's the first film to ever do something like that, to break the mold. Normally, you get kind of a humdrum character in his normal world, and then he's taken out of it. Taken out of it into this new fantastical world where he has to overcome obstacles and eventually defeat some higher power and then return to the regular world. That is the hero's journey. Something you see in every film nowadays. You can Google it. It's a 12-step thing. And if you watch any film now, you'll see that typically it follows. But we begin at the end, and then we follow Charles Foster Kane as he grows up and then descends into madness. And at the end of the film, he's left with nothing. But the film has such deep symbology and such deep cinematography and enormous amounts of props and great set design, great pacing, and very unique lighting effects that you can consider it without a doubt, one of the best films of all time. Now, what these two films have in common is that essentially they pushed the boundaries far for their time. They changed the way filmmaking was done. From those two points onwards, things were a lot different. Things were a lot different. But now we move into the second portion of the talk modern storytelling and media. We're not just talking about filmmaking anymore. We're talking about YouTube, we're talking about Instagram, we're talking about Twitter, we're talking about Facebook, all of these different forms of media. They all have their different styles, they all have the different elements, but most of them actually come down to the same basic elements that you see all throughout filmmaking. A few different shots, a script, an idea, and then the execution of that idea. All for the entertainment or informing of the viewer. And there are, quite literally, hundreds of thousands of creators out there making content, hoping that somebody will enjoy it. Storytelling has evolved so much in the past, say, 20, 30 years, that the career opportunities are endless. Normally, in filmmaking, you have to PA, production assist, for at least one or two years, which is what I'm almost done in the process of doing. And then you move up into what you actually want to do, or a step to what you actually want to do. Nobody becomes a director in two years. No one. In fact, in the process of becoming a director, it is suggested that you direct a play first, because you gain skills by directing a play that you would not gain by directing a film. Because you see, the process of directing a, a film versus a play is that a play is linear. It all happens in a flow. It's consistent, there are no cuts, except for the curtain. In filmmaking, the process is much more segmented. You have shots that you need to get. You have a shot list, really. and. Typically, you're filming five, six days a week, 12-hour days. And so you have all of this time to set up the lighting, set up the actors where they need to be on stage, and get the different shots that you need to get. And the actor actually needs to be in wardrobe and hair and makeup and all these other things. And there's a huge number of moving parts. Typically, the set has to be dressed at least a couple days in advance. Art directors typically actually ask for that. They want more time so that way they're not rushed to create the next set, the next set, the next set. They need prep days. But um, when you film a, you know, a movie, you have all these different shots and the acting is done in spurts. It's done 
line by line, shot by shot. Whereas in theater, you say the line, the other person says the line back and forth and back and forth and scene. In filmmaking, there are different takes for each shot because the director wants to get the best performance he can or he or she can out of the actors. And so if you know anything about <laughs> camp film, which is basically trash but entertaining film, there is a film out there called The Room. Now The Room is famously bad. That's why it is popular, because it is famously bad. But in that movie, there was a shot in which they did 69 different takes over and over and over and over again until Tommy Wiseau got it right. And that's something that is kind of legend. It goes to show that in filmmaking, you know, you can never have enough takes. Well, you can, you really can, but to get the right shot, to get the right acting, you need to have as many takes as it takes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I mean, but directing a play is, is different. You have to be able to manage these actors before the curtain falls, before opening night. You have to make sure that their performance is on key for opening night. If you fail to do that, the play will get bad reviews. So, that's something that every director has to go through. So, We've talked about sort of the major tenets of filmmaking and the, the different kind of major moments in filmmaking that have changed the course of it for forever. Now we're going to talk about the different jobs that exist within the film industry. And we're going to start with breaking down the different departments that there are. So the main ones you need to know, production, Grip and Electric, Art Department, Hair and Makeup, Wardrobe, typically they go hand in hand, and uh, Props, Camera of course, and uh, yeah, those are, those are really the main ones. And each department has top brass, and then they also have people who are kind of working below the line. Really what constitutes the line is whether they have creative control over the movie or the show, depends on what the type of content is. So above the line, you have producers, the money men, people who not only control the money, but also the, the sort of direction that it goes in. The people who procure the different kind of things that the production needs to function. And then you also have the director, the director of cinematography, otherwise known as the cinematographer, and the people who kind of work below them. Now, the director of photography is actually in charge of three departments. Camera, lighting, <laughs> grip and electric. Or, well, really, it's camera, lighting, grip. And camera, you know what that does. They operate the camera. They carry around the tripod. They operate a dolly. A dolly is a moving car. So, that's camera department. And a dolly is essentially, it goes around on the track, and you mount the camera to it. And it's a way of achieving smooth motion, well, in motion. You want a shot to be smooth if you're doing a follow shot. Typically, that's what calls for a dolly. The camera department also um, sometimes uses a jib, which is what the grip department provides. Same with the dolly tracks and you know, mounting the, uh, the camera onto the dolly. But really what the grip department does is they, they make sure everything on, on set is safe. They set up the stands for the lights, which typically are very heavy. There are some things called C-stands, combo stands, and uh, some other ones which have very funky names. Working in grip is it's a very unique thing because the, the terminology is unlike anything <coughs> else. They have nicknames for things that you would never think. Things like a lollipop, which is basically this big metal head that has a one-fourth uh, base. And it, um, it's basically this giant lollipop-looking thing. And so they call it a lollipop. It's strange. And then they have what's called a mambo combo stand, 
which is basically a combo stand with a different kind of adapter on it to a different receiver so that it can receive those one quarter um, uh, lollipops. And essentially, there's just so many different things in this department that you can learn, so many different terminologies, and it's all regional. It's all regional. And essentially, what we do is we make sure everything's safe and that all this, the, the stands are set up. Lighting essentially takes care of, of course, the lights. But they also take care of the electric side. Now, some of these lights that we use on film sets, they're very powerful, very high wattage. And so we have to be careful when we plug them into outlets. We have to make sure that the building that we're operating in has the correct specifications so that we don't blow a fuse or start a fire. And so some of these guys who work in Gripen Electric, they come from other fields. They come from places like um, architecture. They come from places like electricians' work and uh, a number of other things. And it's, it's just a very kind of brotherly group to be a part of. That's the, uh, the profession I'm trying to get into, is grip work. And uh, so that's what the director of photography does. He manages lighting. Camera, grip. The director, of course, focuses on managing talent. You would imagine the director to say things like action and cut. But really, the only thing, actually, they do say those two things. <laughs> but um, the first assistant director takes care of a few very key things. They make sure that the location is what we call locked up. <coughs> so that way we have production assistance at every entrance, making sure the general public does not come in and interrupt the shot, or that crew members who aren't supposed to be in the shot don't enter. So what happens before a shot is taken, essentially, is that first AD calls, lock it up, and the PAs essentially respond with copy, and they lock it up. They don't allow anyone in. And secondly, they, uh, they say, roll it. and what that means is that the camera has to begin rolling, the sound engineer has to begin rolling on sound, and they both say their key things, which is number one, camera speeds, if they're working camera, and then sound speeds. So that lets people know that both camera and sound, audio and visual, or visual and audio, are both rolling. And then the, act, the director can call action. Once the shot is over, the take is over, and the director is satisfied, he'll call cut. And the, uh, the first AD will radio and say, that's a cut. And then the location will be once again open so that way crew members can pass in and out to do what they need to do, whether it's adjusting a light or bringing in new gear or a production assistant has to come in and fan the hazer because a lot of times what, what we'll do in filmmaking is if we want to kind of dramatize a scene or drive home that it's a flashback or something, we'll have a hazer. And we'll have a PA fan the hazer. If it doesn't kind of fan itself, depends on which hazer you have. And uh, it'll add sort of a vignette to the shot. It'll add some depth. I didn't always know I wanted to do filmmaking. I think that the interest kind of became prevalent for me when I was 15, 16. Um, this is going to sound kind of generic, but I was inspired by the way music videos were made and the way that also video game videos were made. And when I heard a song at that point, I felt as if I could see the music video in my head, shot for shot. The subject, the themes, the location, all of it. I didn't know what to call it at the time, but I was able to see it, I could picture it. And having just that vision made me want to pursue this, made me want to learn how to make that real. In so doing, I pursued a degree at Full Sail, which didn't work out for me. And then I pursued a degree at Middlesex Community College, and that worked out well. But before I did any of that, I was an intern at GCTV. 
in high school, I had to have an internship, everyone did, to graduate. And so GCTV kind of took me in and showed me the ropes of how to direct a TV show. Now, doing TV was not exactly what I had in mind at the very beginning, I'll admit. But it proved useful. It proved very useful. And it showed me kind of the technological aspect to it as well. I learned how to edit through GCTV and was given the resources to do so. And I met some very key people who still shape my life today. And I actually, even after pursuing Full Sail and coming back to Connecticut, I did pursue a couple jobs in local access TV. I started working for North Haven Television, and I was doing television production stuff for them, technical directing shows, essentially operating the switcher, sometimes operating camera, setting up microphones, um, doing audio at times. I have done a lot for them um, in experience. And uh, after that, I got involved with sort of a community TV show called Sparrow Falling. Now that was all volunteer, but we shot 10 episodes of a mix of Game of Thrones and Shakespeare over the course of a summer. And now these episodes were not short. They were 30 to 45 minute episodes. With complex set design, it was a fantasy, fantasy show. So you had complex wardrobe, uh, complex writing, complex acting, and um, a very complex storyline. And I was a production assistant and whatever else I needed to be for that show. I, um, I did some prop setup, I did some extra work. I was in it actually, I had a couple speaking parts. And uh, I've actually done some editing for the show as well. And after that, things just kind of skyrocketed because I actually got into the field. After I worked on The Sparrow Falling, the, the guy who created the show, he had a job come in as a PA on a movie called Alien Warfare. Now, it was a B-movie, it's on Netflix, but it was my first PA job, and I worked that job for two and a half weeks, 12-hour days, and it actually fulfilled my internship requirement for my associate's degree as well. Interestingly enough, it come full circle. And from there, I've just been taking every PA job I can get my hands on. I've been trying to network as much as possible in the two years or so that I've been doing PA work. My network has grown by about 400. And now I measure this because in this industry, it's interesting, Facebook is actually the go-to networking platform. You would think normally for business, LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn typically. But in the movie industry, it's Facebook. People don't just want your resume or your profile or your work experience. They do want that, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But they also want your personality. They want people in this industry who are not only hardworking but go-getters with very full backgrounds. And Facebook is one way to kind of vet that out. And after the show's over, you can network with all the people you've connected with um, and go from there. And typically that leads to more work. And that's what you want right now, especially for Connecticut. Eventually, I'm trying to move up to Mass Massachusetts, to Boston, to work around there, because they are the sixth largest market, and they have pretty consistent work and not enough people to do it. So people like me are in demand mm -hmm. up there, and that's where I want to be. When you work a job, it's not just about the work. It's also the social aspect. So when you're on set, you're not just doing your work. You're also connecting with people, mm -hmm. sharing interests sharing history, like maybe you went to the same school. Previously, when I worked on this reality show that I was talking about before, I met some people who went to Full Sail, and we connected by that. And I've also met some people who were into the same TV shows I was into, and we connected by that. And I actually got a job off of it recently, because I connected with people. So filmmaking is just a, as much about the work as it is about the connection. Making it in filmmaking requires you to network. It, it's half about who you know and half about what you know. The other part of it is that, of course, you have to have a car. You have to be able to drive. You have to have a good temperament. You have to have a lot of energy, especially to work these 12-hour days continuously. 
consecutively. But, you know, it's, it's a journey, this what it is. It's a journey which is also a job. And so it's, a lot, it's fulfilling in a number of ways. But you never get exactly where you want to go right away. You have to pay your dues. You have to pay your dues quite a bit. You have to take stuff from people who you don't want to take from. Um, typically what I mean by that is they're rude to you because you're a PA. One of my references, one of the first people I worked for um, on a PA job, he told me this, not exactly verbatim, but very close. I know it's not very American, but it's a class system. And right now, you're in the lower class. Now, that may be a bit, a bit harsh, and truthfully, it was. But when you're a PA, that's the truth. That's the truth. And producers are going to be rude to you. Producers are going to be mean. People from different departments are going to be mean if you're overstepping your boundaries. But it's by this that you become hardened. You learn how to take stuff. You, you learn how to have gumption. You learn how to be your own person and be resilient. Well, I would like to be finishing up doing grip work for the four or five years that I want to do it for and be moving into production. I'd like to be a producer one day after I do grip work for four or five years in Boston. And then uh, after that, someday be a director. But I'm very conscious that I have to pay my dues first. I have to have the experience to direct. Mm -hmm. And people don't like a director who doesn't understand the needs of other departments. And so it's important that I learn that first, whether it be through producing or th by interacting through with people through grip work. But as a PA, I've done more than anything in my, in my work as a PA, I've done art production assistant work, which is, it's a lot of heavy lifting, but it's a lot of artistic direction as well. And so I've grown to appreciate just how many resources art department needs, just what kinds how difficult it is to find that. I've had to find resources myself that the you know, art director wasn't able to find. Mm -hmm. And some things, when they can't find exactly what they need, whether it be a graphic or whatever, they ask somebody in-house to create it. For the docu-series I did recently, they asked me to use Photoshop to recreate photos from an actual crime scene for use in the recreate portion, the recreation portion of that crime scene. And my graphics are going to be on Discovery ID as mm -hmm. a result. So you learn how to be resourceful. You learn how to find things that typically you wouldn't have to find. And that can translate into other parts of your life as well. Mm -hmm. It can help you quite a bit being resourceful. Well, I think with that, we will cut it off here. Thank you guys for attending. And Thank you. I hope to see you next mm -hmm. year. I hope I have a, a fortune next mm -hmm. year as well.